If you've been with us the last several weeks, you know that we have been studying the Israelites in the Old Testament. We've been doing a sermon series out of Deuteronomy, the first several chapters of Deuteronomy. Anytime, here's what I found, anytime you set out to do an expository study of Scripture, whatever it is you're studying, studying has a way of finding timeliness and relevance for the time and situation that you're studying it. That is true of today's passage. We are experiencing so much turmoil, so much evil in our culture today. And I believe that as we come to the latter part of the fourth chapter of Deuteronomy, I believe this morning's passage speaks directly into some of the issues that we're facing. Let me tee up the uh, passage by uh, giving you a perspective. Several things. First, if there's anywhere on the face of the planet where people ought to be able to enjoy and celebrate equality, it's the United States of America. Y'all remember our founding documents? We hold that all men are created equal, that everyone has the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Baked into what this country is all about is this notion that equality should be celebrated and part of American life. But that's not what we find. We continue to struggle with racial division and strife, racism, the awful evil of racism. Here's, a, here's another thing. You know, if anywhere on the face of the planet we should celebrate um, safety and peace and order, it's the United States of America. We are a nation of laws. Now, look, that's not, that's not common. There are many parts of the world that don't have laws and law enforcement like we do. But you know what? I never go to bed at night and worry like many people throughout our world have to worry. I never have to worry. I wonder if something's going to happen to me, my home, and my family in the middle of the night tonight. You know why? Because we in this country celebrate laws and law enforcement. We have public servants. Well, wonderful. Are there are there bad people in any population? Of course there are. But we have wonderful law enforcement officers who are heroes who serve us and protect us. If anywhere on the face of the planet we should celebrate peace and order, it's here. But that's not what we find. We see lawlessness. We see rioting. We see, in fact, I saw anarchists called patriots this past week. Somehow, we're not celebrating what we should as Americans be celebrating. Here's another thing. If anywhere on the face of the planet that we should celebrate and enjoy unity, it's the United States of America. I, I love what, yeah, go ahead. That's fine. I love, what, uh, I love what Abraham Lincoln said about our system of government. It's for the people, it's, it's of the people, by the people, and for the people. And that's true. Our elected officials are there to serve us, to bring about the, to work together to bring about the greatest good for everyone. Now, do we have wonderful public officials? Yes, we do, and I thank God for them. But in many cases, those who lead our country aren't unified, working together to bring about the greatest good for everyone. You know what I see many times? I see what you see. I see one side throwing hand grenades at the other side, trying to destroy the opposing viewpoint instead of working together constructively. So here's what I'm, here's what I'm getting at. Um, the United States of America, uh, when it comes to our country, the United States of America is the last place you would expect to find precisely what we find. You, the question is, of course, how on earth does this happen? How does a country that's 
based on equality and safety and unity and all of those things. How on earth does a country like that devolve into something so depraved? Scripture, I believe, brings us to the answer to that question. If you have your Bibles, uh, prepare them to Deuteronomy chapter 4. I'm going to begin reading in verse 23, but if you haven't been with us, let me just kind of give you the thumbnail sketch of where we are here. Um, There is a group of people called the Israelites that would have, in their future at this point, would have an experience very similar to the one we're experiencing. They were about to move into a land of such promise. In fact, it was called the promised land. God had promised it to them. It was a land of great promise. It was the promised land. The Israelites were about to be given by God a piece of land that was fertile. It could sustain them with food. In fact, the Bible describes it as a land flowing with milk and honey. It was a land that was strategically located. It had access to the sea. It controlled major trade routes through the area. And what I'm, what I'm saying is that land should have been a great blessing. And on top of all that, God's hand of anointing and blessing was on the, what was on this group of people and on that place. So it should have been a wonderful place. But those of you who know the history of the nation of Israel know that it turned out to be something very, very different. In fact, after they moved into the land, they began to fall. They began to have trouble. Blessings turned into curses. And eventually, the nation of Israel would cease to be all together. And it would stay that way for many, many centuries. But before they moved in to this promised land, as we've discussed, in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses, their leader, gathers them around and prepares them for the more that they're about to experience, for the blessing they're about to seize, for the promised land that they are about to inhabit. And as he does so, he gives them a warning. And it's a warning that they, it would end up, they would not heed. And it was a warning that how something that would, in fact, happen could happen in the first place. Deuteronomy chapter 4, I'll begin reading in verse 23. Would you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's holy word? Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 23. Moses says, Be careful not to forget the covenant of the Lord your God that he made with you. Do not make for yourselves an idol in the form of anything the Lord your God has forbidden. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. After you have had children and grandchildren and have lived in the land a long time, if you then become corrupt and make any kind of idol, doing evil in the eyes of the Lord your God and arousing his anger, I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you this day that you will quickly perish from the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. You will not live there long, but will certainly be destroyed. You may be seated. Moses, preparing the Israelites for a great promised land, great blessing, said, be sure, be sure that when you get into that land and you start enjoying the blessings of that land, that you don't forget the blesser. He said, be absolutely certain you don't put anything above God. Don't have any idols in your life. Don't give yourself to anything above God. Quite frankly, church, keep God number one. Keep God number one. Listen very closely. When a person or a culture puts anything above God, when a person or a culture puts blessings 
or movements ahead of God, that person is facing trouble. And they will sever the relationship that they have, fellowship they have with God. Now, let me just say something obvious, kind of make sure we're all on the same page. Something, something sits atop your priority list. Say that a different way. There is something in your life that's most important to you. Now, there are many things in your life that are important to you. There are many things in my life that are important to me. But there is something in every single one of our lives. There is something that is most important to you. Let me give you some examples of what some of those things are. For some people, it's a career. A career for many people is the most important thing in life. You know how I know? Because they give such huge offerings to it. They will offer time and effort and money and all these things to build a career, even at great sacrifice. If it costs them a church family, that's okay as long as the career, the career comes first. It can cost them a family, but that's okay because the career comes first. For some people, the thing that sits in the number one spot of life is a career. For others, it's politics. This is an election year, as you know. And uh, I dare say that there are many Christians this year who will tweet and post mo more about their favorite candidate than they will about Jesus. They will talk more about political platforms than they will about the gospel. Poli and it, when, when politics is the most important thing in your life, here's the way you think. If the wrong person happens to get elected in the next election, it is over. Because all my faith, all my trust, all my hope lies in an election. For some people, for many people, career is number one. Politics is number one. I mean, I can go on and on with this. For many, popularity is number one. For many people, the most important thing in life is to be accepted, liked, and loved. And they will do whatever it takes to be accepted by other people, to be popular, to be loved by others. Popularity can become a God to you. On and on I could go. But Moses warned the Israelites, if this wonderful blessing that you're about to embrace is to remain a wonderful blessing, you have to be certain that you keep God number one. Don't let anything in your life become more important to you than your pursuit of God. Now, Moses tells them why. And the, answer, the reason why might be a bit surprising. Moses said, the reason you gotta make sure that you keep God first in your life is because God's jealous. Do y'all remember what he said? For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Now, at first, that sounds like Moses is saying something not nice about God. I mean, wait a minute, are you, are you putting God down? Are you belittling God? By call? Because we know that jealousy is a sin. Some jealousy is a sin. In other words, it's sinful, it's wrong to... To be jealous of what someone else has. To look on their possessions, for example, with envy. Wishing what they had belonged to you. That's wrong. That's sinful. But that's not the kind of jealousy that Moses is speaking of here. There is, in fact, a legitimate and righteous form of jealousy. I'll give you an example. God has programmed all of us with this legitimate form of this capacity to be jealous. Let's say, for example, now this, this, is, a, this, is, a, this is a hypothetical situation. Okay. Let's say you're uh, out shopping with your spouse. And um, you turn the corner with your spouse and lo and behold, you run into a high school friend of your spouse of the opposite sex. And they say, oh my goodness, I haven't seen you in years. And you're sitting there kind of as the third wheel watching this conversation take place. And in the midst of the conversation, you notice, you notice that the high school friend 
begins to flirt with your spouse. Oh, how's that going to make you feel? Prayerfully, you're unarmed. But, <laughs> but I'll tell you how it's going to make you feel. Prayerfully, it's going to make you feel jealous. You, why is, now, why is that? Because jealousy is a legitimate emotion that rises in the soul when anything threatens to take your rightful place. Moses tells the Israelites, make sure you understand something. Here's why it's so important you keep God number one. God's jealous. God will not stand for anything or anyone that threatens to take his rightful place. Don't ever think, don't ever think that you can ride through life with God in the back seat. It does not work that way. Uh, God, God is a jealous God and he will not tolerate anything coming before him. Now here's why that's important to you and to me and to our country and to the world. Here's why it's so important. Moses in chapter 4 verse 37 says this. You had, you're going to have this wonderful place because God loved your ancestors and chose your descendants after them. He brought you out of Egypt by his presence and his strength to drive out before you nations greater and stronger than you and to bring you into their land and to give it to you for your inheritance as it is today. You know why it's so important that we keep a jealous God number one in our lives? Because God is the source of all good things. God is the source of every good thing in your life. Moses tells the children, don't ever think, don't ever think that you're going to enjoy this wonderful promised land because of something you've done. Because that's not why. He said, God has given you. God has done this for you. Don't ever forget that it's God's blessing to you, not something you've earned yourself. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Now, Pastor Jeff, I understand this may apply at some level, but not all the way for me because you don't know my story. I have worked hard in my life. I've worked multiple jobs. I put myself through school. I built a business from the ground up. I made great sacrifice to build what, I, what I've been able to attain today. And that's wonderful. Listen, it is righteous to work hard. It is good to work hard. I believe that the best, work, the best hardest workers in any company ought to be the Christians. Because the Bible teaches that a strong work ethic is righteous and expected. Uh, the New Testament says this. If a man doesn't work, if he doesn't work hard, doesn't have a good work ethic, if he doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. That's the way the New Testament puts it. So it's good to work hard. We, we should all work hard. But before you claim responsibility for your blessing, consider the question. Who gave you the ability to work hard to build what you have? Who gave you the physical, mental ability? Several years ago, I mean, it's one of these, one of these experiment, ex experiences that kind of hits you upside the head like a ton of bricks. I was having a conversation. I met a man, and he was in a wheelchair. He didn't have any legs. And he was explaining to me how he was born that way. And uh, I walked away from that conversation asking myself, I wonder what I did to deserve the legs I was born with. That really hit me. Uh, what did I do to deserve uh, being born with the ability to think? You say, Pastor Jeff, the jury's still out on that. Well, maybe. But you know what I'm saying. What, what, gave, what gave us the right, you and me, the right before we were born to be able to live in a place like this as opposed to a third world country where people don't even have food to eat? What did you and I, what, who gave you the opportunity, who gave you the strength, who gave you the skill, who gave you the mental capacity to be able to have what you have? James, the half-brother of Jesus, said it this way. Every good and perfect gift. 
not some, not most. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. See, here's what's, here's what's happening, I believe. I believe that in general, we have, dis, we have taken God off the throne and we have replaced him with other things. And when we do that, we sever, we sever fellowship with a jealous God. We sever fellowship with the source of all good things. And that's precisely how blessings, things that should be great blessings, can become such curses. I want to finish this, tie all this together with an illustration a friend reminded me of this past week. Many of you know Dr. Tony Evans. He's a friend of this church. In fact, he's preached from this pulpit. Wonderful man, wonderful pastor. And Dr. Evans illustrates this this way. He talks about football Sunday. And he says, on football, you may have heard this. On football Sunday, he says, two teams take the field. Now, these two teams are very, very different. They're in different uniforms. They have different coaches. They've been taught in different ways. Uh, they have different playbooks. They have different plays that they run. And for 60 minutes on football Sunday, those two teams are at war with each other. They're in conflict with each other. They have, they have different objectives. They each want to win the game. They each want to do different things. Uh, they have different values. They have different ways of doing things. And they are in conflict for 60 minutes. But then Dr. Evans describes a third team that also takes the field on football Sunday. These don't wear the uniforms of one side or the other. They wear stripes. They're the officials sent there by the National Football League to officiate the game. Now, here's their job. Their job is to represent those in authority in the NFL. They're there to represent the commissioner. And they have a playbook of their own. Now, it's not the playbook they either side uses. It's a playbook given by the commissioner that describes how the game of football should be played. And the official's job on that football field is to make sure that both teams are following and observing the rules given by those in authority. They are representatives of the commissioner to bring to bear the rules of football on the field of play. In other words, they're on the field, but they're not of the field. Now, here's what can happen. Dr. Evans explains. Here's what can happen. Let's say that one of the officials begins to have more loyalty to one team or the other than he does to the commissioner he's there on behalf of. Let's say, for example, when one team does something wrong, he's quick to throw the flag. But when the other team does some, the same thing wrong, he hold, keeps the flag in his pocket. If the officials ever align with one side or the other more than they are aligned with the authority, two things happen. Number one, the official loses credibility as an official. And number two, that official breaks fellowship with the commissioner. The commissioner is not going to be able to use that official as an official any longer. Christians, we are in this world, but we are not of this world. And in our world, you know this, in our world, there are sides waging war against each other. We have different races waging war against each other. We have different political parties waging war against each other. Even in industry, we have companies waging war against each other. And we are Christians. We are the ones who are representing the one in authority. 
And we have a book of our own, and this is our playbook. And as Christians, our role is to be sure that the one in authority's instructions and rules for engagement are obeyed by both sides equally. But here's what can happen. When our loyalties to anything else rises above our loyalty to our God, two things happen. We lose credibility as ambassadors. And number two, we break fellowship with a jealous God who is the source of all good things. Christians, the world is counting on us. First and foremost, you are not black or white. You're a Christian. First and foremost, you are not a Republican or Democrat. You're a Christian. First and foremost, you are not a liberal or conservative. You are a Christian. And my prayer is this, that Christians will recalibrate in their own minds and hearts God as the number one priority for us and that we serve as his ambassadors effectively in a world, listen, that is raging out of control. Church, you and I are the world's only hope as ambassadors of Christ. Is there anything in your life that has displaced God from number one? Is there, you know, maybe in the remainder of our service when the music comes, maybe you would like to just bow your heart before God and ask him, God, would you reveal to me anything that might, I might be more loyal to than I am to you? And help me to be an effective ambassador to bring about godly change in our world. But before we sing, I want to speak to those of you who have not yet accepted Jesus as Savior. You know, here's the tragedy of life. The tragedy of life is that many spend so much time and so much effort all of their lives trying to figure out what life's all about. They try many things and they try diligently many things. And yet they end up asking the question, isn't there more to life than this? See, here's the truth. Every single human being was created for relationship and fellowship with our Creator. And until we have relationship and fellowship with our Creator, we will never experience joy, peace, and fulfillment that we all pursue. The good news is God has made a way for you to have fellowship and relationship with him when he sent his son Jesus into this world to die in your place, to pay for your sin. Jesus offers to take sin out of the way so that you and God can enjoy relationship and fellowship together. Let me ask you, are you in relationship and fellowship with God? Have you trusted what Jesus did on your behalf to make that possible? If not, I'm going to invite you to pray along with me. I'm going to lead you in a, in a model prayer. Your prayer might sound like this. It might sound a little different. But the important thing is that you cry out to your creator in these next few moments, asking him to accept you into his family. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes. Your prayer might sound something like this. Dear God, I recognize I've blown it. I've fallen short. And I recognize my need for your forgiveness. I believe Jesus, your son, died on a cross in my place. And then three days later, he rose from the dead. And in this moment, I place all my trust, all of my hope in what Jesus did for me to rescue me from my sin and make a relationship with you possible. Receive me into your family as I accept Jesus into my life. In his name I ask it. Amen.
If that was your prayer and you're in the room this morning, I want to encourage you on your way out to visit guest services. It's over to the left-hand side of our foyer as you leave. At guest services, we've prepared information that we think is helpful to you. It explains what it means to become a Christian and to live as a Christian. So please go by and receive it from us. Now, if you're watching online, we would love to get this into your hands as well. But the only way that we know to do that is to ask you for your mailing address. We can receive your mailing address in one of several ways. If you're watching on our website, just above the video box you're watching, there's a link uh, to our decision response form. Click that link, fill the form out, submit it to us. Uh, if you're watching on Facebook Live, go to the comment section. You'll find a link to that same form there. And of course, if you're watching on our mobile app, you'll have to go back to the home screen to find that same link. If you, mail, if you give us your mailing address, we'll send to you in the mail this week some literature that will be helpful to you. Church, we're going to uh, sing another song together, and I pray that as, as we sing and worship in this final song, in these final songs, that uh, you will spend some time in prayerful reflection, reflecting and responding to what God's done in your life.